Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultations, and grant that we have in thy fear always before our eyes and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections. The result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public weal, peace and tranquility of the island, and uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This Honorable Senate now resumes its sittings for the 4th of June, 2020, Thursday. Um, by way of brief remarks, I just indicate that the country continues its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as usual, we recognize the role of our health workers and policy makers who seek to move the approach to the virus to, I think the phrase now is living with COVID as we seek to open the economy. Um, and we continue to thank the Almighty God to, who has given our policymakers the intelligence to deal with the issue and the stamina to our health workers, particularly those who are involved in tracing and so on. And so far, although we note another death from COVID, bringing the total of 10 Jamaicans who have died, well, of course, we are saddened by that, but the truth is that, as they say, it could be very much worse. So we are thankful for the blessings which we have got. Um, at the last sitting of the Senate, the Senate noted the passing of much-loved Member of Parliament, Shahine Robinson. I am informed that the Senate, the, the lower house where Senator, where Member of Parliament, Shahine Robinson sat, will in due course arrive at an appropriate form for a um, sitting to recognize her contribution to the Parliament and the country. Uh, we do not know yet what form that will take, so I'm going to ask members who are no doubt anxious to place on record their um, sentiments concerning the passage of Member of Parliament Robinson to keep those sentiments and in time an appropriate format will be arrived at for us to place our sentiment on record. I know, for example, that Senator Lambert Brown and Senator Gale, both of whom interacted with her in her capacity as Minister of Labor, no doubt would wish to say something, and of course Senator Morris. So in due course, um, we will have, I will indicate the appropriate format. I think I've covered most things. Statements by ministers. Announcements. 
laid on the table of the Senate today are the following. Minister Paper Number 24 and Annual Report of the Students' Loan Bureau for the year 2015-2016. Independent Commission of Investigations Quarterly Report for the period January to March 2020 entitled Detained at Pleasure Institutionalized Human Rights Breaches. The Auditor General's Report on the Validation of the Fiscal Impact of COVID-19 for the Suspension of the Fiscal Rules. Financial Administration and Audit Suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020. Fis Financial Administration and Audit Suspension of Fiscal Target, Target Requirements Order 2020 Resolution under the Financial Administration and Audit Act. Thank you. Bills brought from the Honorable House of Representatives, petitions, papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally. Mr. President, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the Senate, I will move under the Fiscal Financial pardon me, Administration and Audit Act the Financial Administration and Audit Suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020 Resolution. Whereas, by virtue of Section 48C3B of the Financial Administration and Audit Act, hereinafter referred to as the Act, the Minister, having regard to the validation of the Auditor General, may make an order subject to affirmative resolution permitting the requirements referred to in Section 48C1A and B of the Act to be suspended for an initial period and, as the case may require, for an extended period in accordance with Section 48C4 of the Act. And whereas on the second day of June 2020, the Minister made the Financial Administration and Audit suspension of, fi suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020, and whereas it is desirable that the Financial Administration and Audit suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020 be affirmed, now, therefore, be it resolved by this Honorable Senate as follows. One, this, suspend, this resolution may be cited as the Financial Administration and Audit Suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020 Resolution. Two, the Financial Administration and Audit Suspension of Fiscal Target Requirements Order 2020, which was laid on the table of the Senate on the fourth day of June 2020, is hereby affirmed. Mr. President, I beg to give further notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of standing orders to enable me to take this motion. Thank you very much, Minister. Questions and answers to questions. Motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to the sitting of the Senate. Motions for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without the leave of the Senate first obtained. Public business, Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, is, is intended today to uh, proceed with the order of which I just gave notice and uh, thereafter to proceed with the Joint Select Committee uh, report on the bill popularly known as the anti-gang bill. And uh, that will be led by Minister Samuda, who is present, but uh, out of the chamber at this point in time. That being said, Mr. President, I now move for suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion notice of which I gave earlier. Thank you very much, Minister. Members, you have heard the uh, Minister. Are those in favor? Aye. Against? Aye. Thank you, Minister. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. President, the Senate would have received, uh, it having been tabled today, the uh, validation from the Auditor General that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to Jamaica being declared a disaster area, is above the threshold of 1.5% of GDP, and that consistent with the provisions of Section 48C3B of the Financial Audit and Administration Act, uh, it now uh, falls to us to seek 
approval by affirmative resolution of the order now before us. This order will have the result of suspending Jamaica's fiscal rules for the initial period of this financial year ending March 31, 2021. Uh, Mr. President, I believe that the I had asked for some copies to be made available of the Auditor General's report, knowing that we would have um, had them uh, virtually uh, as in the normal course of them being tabled, just in case any member wanted to take a quick look. Uh, but in the meantime, I don't know if you want to click a link or in, I imagine if they have not yet been circulated, the copies. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. They should be with you shortly. Uh, but. Just to recap very, uh, very quickly, certainly Jamaica's fiscal rules were given the force of law in, 2020, in 2010 and strengthened in 2014, uh, which at that time there was provision made for what we'll term an escape clause. And under this, the fiscal responsibility framework provided for under the FAA Act and uh, related legislation, the events that can trigger an escape are outside of the control of the government. These are the severe economic downturn, natural disaster, health and other disasters, public emergencies, matters which rise to a level within the categories provided for uh, in the original act and as have been enhanced at our last sitting. But it's important to note, Mr. President, that the suspension can only be activated by independent verification that the fiscal impact or the eventuality, uh, the event or eventuality, as the law puts it, exceeds the threshold of 1.5% of GDP. So, Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic is the event uh, on, which the government, on which the government relies. Uh, that has led to the triggering and activation of the suspension uh, in our fiscal responsibility framework. And uh, as advised and as noted in that other place on Tuesday, the fiscal rules are being suspended for the following reasons. One, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the need to deploy significant additional fiscal resources, primarily in the form of social and economic support through the CARE program, health expenditure on new personal protective equipment and supplies, as well as additional capacity building uh, undertakings, and C, other critical expenditures uh, which have been part of the general response, which together total $34 billion. And I referred to that figure last week, uh, Mr. President. Accommodation of these additional expenditures would not be possible unless the fiscal rules were suspended. And in, in put otherwise, Mr. President, the, we must suspend the fiscal rules in order to respond to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, also spoken to last week and referred to by the minister in that other place on Tuesday, economic activity will contract significantly this fiscal year as a result of the pandemic. And it, the expectation, broadly put, is that the contraction will be in the region of 5.1%. I gave a figure last week as well, Mr. President, that revenues will be lowered by approximately $81 billion, and then there was the additional $5 billion in other revenues which we will not earn, presenting us with what persons easily recall as the $120 billion challenge. Uh, Mr. President, essentially the loss of revenue together with the, uh, the increased requirements for expenditure mean that it will neither be possible, practical, nor desirable to achieve the level of fiscal savings that the fiscal rules would otherwise require. And for this reason, uh, we must proceed with the suspension. Um, Mr. President, uh, these were brief reminders of matters referred to last week when we uh, sought the approval of this House of the legislation, which would broaden uh, the categories uh, of, of circumstances under which the, under which we could seek to uh, suspend. And Mr. President, I will only make uh, or emphasize a point which was made last week. Um, there was a question raised as to whether the provision for the economic contraction would not already have been met such that it would not have required an amendment as has been undertaken by both houses. 
And uh, this, I understand, was taken elsewhere again based on the fact that the PIOJ uh, stated in their uh, reference, which was an appendix to the um, Auditor General's report, that in their opinion, the circumstances that were required to trigger the suspension existed. But this was not the technical advice from the Financial Secretary, which was that the economic contraction would have had to have been experienced already based on the language in the law, and that a, a, a mere projection would not have met the legal standard required, such that um, the perspective of the, and this, this shows the benefit of the checks and balances, because while the PIOJ had a particular um, perspective, the financial secretary certainly had a different one and had sought legal advice, and the legal advice, together with the technical advice of the financial secretary, was followed by the Minister of Finance in uh, seeking to have promulgated the legislation which we passed last week in both houses. So, Mr. President, it's quite clear, and they, uh, certainly the opposition had concurred uh, and offered its support in respect of the fact that the need to have the supplementary estimates uh, tabled is important, and uh, it is also similarly important to seek a suspension of the fiscal rules and to change the date by which the 60% debt target ought to be met. Um, so those matters are not in dispute, Mr. President, uh, and, and it now falls to us to uh, follow through on the process, which has been uh, acted on by the relevant parties, being the PIOJ, the Minister, and the Auditor General, and the alacrity with which they have acted uh, is part of the reason that we are, in fact, sitting today in a special sitting at a special time to ensure that there is no, on, um, there's no delay which we can avoid in taking us to the point that will allow the supplementary debate, to, uh, estimates rather, to be debated at the earliest opportunity. So in that context, Mr. President, I put the order for the affirmation of this House and look forward to hearing the comments uh, on both sides in respect of this matter. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Minister. President. Senator Brown, normally you bat at normally you bat at nine. Sorry? Normally you bat at nine. <laughs> Senator Brown. Mr. President, permit me as a black man, as a member of this Senate, to say as I rise to discuss this issue affecting our country, that things abroad also affect the decision that we're in. Which is why, Mr. President, I can hear the cry of George Floyd. I can't breathe. George Floyd, not Floyd Morris. I can't read. I also hear the cry this morning of Eric Garner saying the same thing a couple of years before. I can't read. I wish the record of this Senate will reflect my and all of us solidarity with the people of the United States of America who are fighting against racism and police killing of black people. Mr. President, a friend of Jamaica was Martin Luther King. He said that riots are the language of the unheard. I hope that the people of the United States marching and laying and kneeling are being heard and the riots will stop. I know the rest of the officers who were involved in the killing of, Floyd, of George Floyd, whose memorial starts today. 
Mr. President, in a time like this, not only Martin Luther King do I recall, I recall great men like Claude McKay, who wrote to the world, if we must die. I recommend to the American people, to the black people of America, that poem of Claude McKay. And you know, it is interesting that Churchill used it and never ascribed ownership. Which is why we must, con consider Churchill we must recognize was Claude, using Claude McKay. McKay's poem. Right in long ago, I think it's 1917 that he wrote it. So powerful and poignant today. And how can we forget Robert Nestor Marley, who immemorialized the words of his emperor, El Selassie, in the song, War, and in the color of a man's skin. is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. And so, as Jamaicans, I believe I speak on all of us behalf in sending the solidarity of this Senate to the Black Caucus in the United States Congress and to the people of the United States. We stand with you and we will march with you when we can. Mr. President, in respect to the resolution before us, I recall last week when we discussed the amendment to the bill, Senator Don Webby said, we should work together. I wrote it down. We should work together. We should work together in tackling the impact of COVID-19 on, COVID on our country. This opposition shares that view that we should work together. And working together must include the giving of time to reflect and weighty issues like the amendment that we took last week and that was rushed through in the other place. Working together means a process of sharing information and trying to work jointly to find solutions to the problem. It cannot be a one man or a one side view alone. It has to be a give and take. It has to be a willingness to arrive at solutions, which may be the same as you started, or it may be different from you started. But Senator Gill and I are aware of that process of consultation and how important it is to the country. This is not a time, Mr. President, that we should be disagreeing on whether something is constitutional or unconstitutional. I note in passing that the South African courts have struck down Senator Brown some of the restrictions imposed by their government has been unconstitutional. There has been that discussion in Jamaica, whether the approach is constitutional or unconstitutional. As a country facing the impact of COVID, it would have been good for us to resolve that issue. On the one hand, there's the view of Dr. Light Barnett, the re renowned constitutional lawyer that I do not describe as a partisan, but somebody who is a patriot, who loves our country and wants to see our country march forward. He's the foremost expert on the Constitution and is often referred to by the courts of the land and other courts, including the Privy Council. Mr. President, he has put a view about whether things are constitutional or not. There are others who have put a view that what is being done is okay because the way it is being done avoids the oversight of the parliament 
and the role of the opposition. That's not working together. Let us be clear. That's not working together. If you set out to avoid the oversight of the parliament and the role of the opposition in that. In other words, like Barnett course requires us to declare a state of national emergency based on section 20 of the constitution because of the infectious disease. State of public disaster if you want. The constitution allows to do that. The opposition said, let's take the Barnett route. Others have said, no, let's take the route of those whose experience has not been well founded in defense and support of the constitution. I speak about, Mr. President, those who argue that the Bail Act, we should experiment with it. The court struck it down as unconstitutional. There are those who say the letters of resignation by senators were good. The court struck that down as unconstitutional. There are others who argue that we can't delay the needs bill as requested by the opposition senators. It must be pushed through, but the courts have found the needs bill to be unconstitutional constitutional. I can't be guided here by those who have expressed publicly that it, is, it may be important to abridge, abrogate, and infringe the Constitution. So in a debate between, Senate, between Dr. Light Barnett and the Attorney General of Jamaica, I go for Light Barnett. And it's interesting, Mr. President, that yesterday... So, Mr. President, on a point of order, yes. I think I heard, I heard Senator Brown said that somebody suggested that uh, argued for the abrogation, and in particular the word infringement of the Constitution. Whatever the Attorney General may have said, I'm absolutely sure that she didn't argue for the infringement. I'm sure Senator Brown is mistaken. You know that I've heard many, many points of order in, in the Senate, and let me just say that that is an excellent point of order. Uh, and the clerk has turned around and shake her head in full agreement with my ruling. So Senator Brown, perhaps the minister is asking, the member, no. the, hold on a man, we don't have to get into an argument, you know, the, the member is asking you, I suggested that perhaps you overstated the matter, you could just clarify it and move on. Mr. President, I do not intend to interrupt my speech or to give you the quotation where the Attorney General said earlier when we start talking about the states of emergency, that it may be necessary to abridge, abrogate, and infringe the rights of the people of Jamaica. I stand by those words, and I will back it up by finding the quotation that she made. No, you can and you will. Let's move on. So the point I'm making is simple is. Right, so, so hold on a little bit. So, so what you are saying then? I stand by it. Is that you stand by it? So and if I fail to find it, I will withdraw it. Beautiful. But for now, I stand by it. That's excellent. Mr. President, the reality is, if I have a choice between Dr. Light Barnett, view of the Constitution, and that of the Attorney General, given what I just outlined, I stand with Dr. Light Barnett. I was making a point, Mr. President, that yesterday, another attorney, whatever you may think of him, decided that some of the restrictions in the courts, for example, of hearing appeals by Zoom is unconstitutional, and suffice it to say, he says he's on his way to the Privy Council with that. So, it's not a matter of philosophy. It's a matter of how we work together. If it is the proper way to do it under the Constitution of Clause 20. That's the way we should go, working together. This opposition have supported 
despite our disagreement with the state of emergency. It's renewal, time after time, that it has been brought here. And would we'll take the same approach to COVID if it is brought under the Constitution where the 14 days exist and then the renewal after. It could never have been the intention of the Parliament that the disaster risk management could be used to lock out Jamaicans out of Jamaica, could be used to restrict our movements and not have the stamp of approval of the Constitution of Jamaica. It was not the intention of those who passed the bill in the majority in 2014 to take that route. And again, Minister, as part of that working together that Senator Webby spoke about, I urge the government to reconsider the approach. In fact, we might find out later that the cost to Jamaica of lawsuits become significant, yet they were avoidable if we had taken the principal position of Light Barnett, the patriotic position of Light Barnett, over the partisan position of others of going the route of the Constitution. So, Senator Brown, listen, listen to this. Hear, hear what I'm saying to you. Lawyers disagree about matters. The courts are there to determine and adjudicate legal matters. To refer to one lawyer's position as patriotic and one as not patriotic doesn't really reflect how the legal profession operates. I said the other person was partisan. And there must be a freedom. Hold on a bit. There must hold be a, hold on a little just bit. as lawyers hold on, differ. No, hold on a little bit now. Listen, listen a little bit. Some of the lawyers who disagree with Senator Barnett are highly competent persons who have served Jamaica in, in the highest positions of the legal profession, you know. So I would, I don't, it's not taken as a point of order, but as, a, as an attorney myself, I'm sure that you, you need to reconsider that because they disagree with Lord ba Lloyd Barnett, they are partisan, that's not fair, man. Mr. President, I maintain that the Attorney General is partisan, right? That just don't, we don't need, I'm moving on from this part. I'm moving on from this point, but the freedom of senators to speak their mind and give their opinion is supported by the constitution of this country. And I uphold my constitutional right to draw and to give my opinion and the approach. Yeah, but I stand here, by. I'm but moving here, on. No, no, there. no, but hear what I'm telling you. I sit here and think of one of the attorneys who disagree with Lloyd Barnett and to describe him no, as I described that Tony General. Hold on, man. Hold I on. described that Tony no, General as no. partisan. Let me finish. Not everybody. To, to, uh, to ascribe partisanship to the lawyer who I'm thinking about in particular, who sat as in the highest, as a matter of fact, he was given an order of Jamaica for his service to the legal profession and to describe him as partnership, partisan. We can't sit here and, uh, and make you do that. Mr. President, Mr. President. Mr. President, if you are being honest with yourself on the Senate, you will admit that I never described anyone other than the Attorney General as being partisan. And you mustn't do that, And President. on a point of order, Mr. President, and a point of order, to describe the Attorney General, a member of the other House, as partisan, that our views are provoked by m motives different from the law, is also improper. It is a more. It is, it is to. It's it, it is to. It is ascribe ill motive to a member of the parliament, which I understand is not permitted. I could be wrong, of course. Mr. President, I'm moving on with your permission. Come again. So, I'm moving on because All right, so, ever so, since so members one, of one, parliament one are not partisan, one it's minute. amazing. One minute. Senator Brown says that he's moving on, but he has given me an undertaking with, with a certain amount of matters. And I know, I know, I will, if, if what you are saying is that you, I heard what I heard. And what I heard was Barnett was patriotic, 
persons that di disagreed with him were partisan. No, no, no. That is, no, but no, hold on no, a little no, bit. No, no, no. If, if that is not what I heard, then so be it. Mr. But you can't, you can't just come Mr. in and, say and just th throw a word from people and my parties, and I don't appreciate that. Mr. President, maybe you want to seek the advice of answer. Because in that case, you may owe us an apology on this side. But let me move on. Because I don't know how we could come to a point where members of parliament are not partisan. It's amazing if you think otherwise. Mr. President, Mr. President, this, this COVID impact, this COVID, this COVID impact on the budget of the country. Senator Brown is entitled to be heard with respect, and I would. Oh, is Senator Skeffrey, you are interrupting the man. He's entitled to be heard. So please continue. Thank you for your protection. You're welcome, Senator Brown. I try to protect everybody. everybody. Mr. President, there's a myth, there's a myth at large that the economic fallout which we face now began with the COVID episode and the first case of a COVID patient in March of this year. Uh, no, I'll wait, I'll wait. He's going to get this chance to speak and I'll probably come up, I'll probably I, come up there and talk to you while he's speaking. I, no, my, <laughs> I, ap I apologize. It was no, 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 we were having a, a discussion about um, nice ball, a nice ball that was bold. <laughs> no, but no, we just no. stroke back to the American, boundary. American I understand. Politics. I understand. Mr. President, the myth that the COVID fallout began in March this year is one that needs to be debunked. There are those who argue that there are those who argue that we could not foresee what was happening. Well, you know, Mr. President, Mr. President, sorry, leave him alone. In February of this year, in the 5th of February, the JMEA spoke to the impact. Is that leave him down? I, don't, I will show him. I'll bring it to his attention. The <laughs> the spoke to the impact of the coronavirus on the country. And the country's economy. The fifth of February. That was Mr. Pandui speaking about it publicly, carried in the observer. Didn't start in March, started before that. And the but you know what happened on the 5th of March? <laughs> I think the colleagues on this side may better recall it than those on the other side. The 5th of March is when a by-election was declared in Clarendon. So while the private sector was seeing the COVID negative impact on the economy, the government was busy calling a by-election to settle issues within their party. On the 3rd of March, Mr. Gazanazan from the private sector spoke about a hurricane coming that the corona impact was like a hurricane. It was going to impact prices, etc. So the narrative of the government that they just buck up on this thing, buck up on this thing in March, doesn't ring true. The fact of the matter is that 
On the 3rd of March, the opposition in the Standing Finance Committee raised the issue about the COVID impact on the budget. And what did the Minister of Finance say? All is well. I had my people in the ministry check the tourism figures yesterday. And all was well. No reduction in bookings and so forth. That's the 3rd of March in the Standing Finance Committee right here in this parliament. But others was, was, were seeing what was coming. The government was too busy electioneering. So they built a budget around the election. They built a budget around the election. So the minister could come to parliament and you may want to take point of order on this and say, up, up, forward, heading in the right direction. But in that very same budget debate, Mr. Mark Golden, Member of Parliament, Opposition Spokesperson on Finance, said all was not well, that there's a savaging ahead of us as a result of economic tides. So yes, Mark Golden saw it. The government might not have recognized it, but he spoke to it in the budget debate. And then Dr. Peter Phillips spoke to it in the budget debate. And he spoke long. And he rebuked the minister over the fiscal rules, which he was not adhering to. So this myth, this Anansi story, that it came upon us, like Nicodemus. It's not true. The reality is that they had abandoned the task of preparing government and gone to Clarendon to campaign. That is what happened. Mr. President, I'm sorry my friend Senator Gill just walked out. Because on page two, on page two of the PIOJ report, appendix one of the Auditor General report, the following is stated. Real sector developments. So I hope somebody will tell my friend Senator Gale when he comes up. This is what it says. Prior to the advent of COVID-19, industries within the goods producing industry, mining, quarrying, and construction, were being adversely impacted by plant downtime and reduced levels of construction activities. These negatives outweigh the impact of improved weather conditions on agriculture, as well as increased capacity utilization in the manufacturing sector, and resulted in an overall contraction in, goods, in the goods producing industry of an estimated 1.5%. So the, 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 the myth that it started after COVID has been exposed by the Planning Institute of Jamaica. They said prior to the advent of COVID. And Mr. President, as an avid reader of the fiscal policy papers presented by governments. That information was already in the fiscal policy paper presented to us at the budget time. In fact, relative to the first quarter of last year, 2019-2020, when we had a 1.7% growth for that quarter, the second quarter saw 0.6% growth, a reduction taking place. In the third quarter, Mr. President, and in December, and in December 2019, starting 
who does the measurement declared that we had a 0.4 decline in the economy. And the representative of finance is here. You can check those figures. Starting report after PIOJ said PIOJ gave it a small uptick. Starting the real measures of the economy said we declined 0.14. And here, let me make it clear. That put an end to 19 consecutive quarters of positive growth in the economy starting in 2013 or thereabout under the People's National Party. So let us be clear. The growth, the 19 consecutive quarters started under the PNP. They continued it as it ought to be. But by the beginning of the last fiscal year, the signs of a slowing down in the economy had appeared, captured in the fiscal policy paper, captured by PIOJ, and again reported here, now that Senator Gill is back in the chamber, in the appendix to the Auditor General report. Senator Gill, if you look at page two, I don't know if I gave you a copy. Page two of the appendix. It says, prior to the advent of COVID-19, industries within the good producing industry, mining, quarrying, and construction were being adversely impacted by plant downtime and reduced levels of construction activities. These negative factors outweigh the impact of improved weather conditions on agriculture, as well as increased capacity utilization in the manufacturing industry, and resulted in an overall contraction in the goods producing industry of an estimated 1.5%. So, my good friend, don't make them tell you say it started after COVID. It started before. Mr. President, following on the December quarter, Following on the December quarter, the March quarter has been measured. And the March quarter shows a decline of 1.7%. So two consecutive quarters of negative growth gives you a recession. The Prime Minister was correct in Parliament in saying, talking about recession. Two. Two give you a recession. But me not going to argue with you over that. Because if you want three, you're getting three. Arvin will sit, show them the V again, Arvin. And tell them that V means two. No, it don't mean shower. Don't mix yourself up with that. Don't mix yourself up with that person. So, Mr. President. Mr. President. The, Mr. President, never put up man. Mr. President, never. Mr. President? Yeah. I know it must be tough. Man. It so is. Just do it. It is, just undoubtedly. Do it. Just do it. I, the poker face couldn't even be held. Just do it. Mr. President, the speaker's time having expired, might it be extended to allow him to complete his presentation? Members, those in favor? Mr. President, let me thank the minister. Minister, the arms are still wide open. <laughs> you may come in if you're in there. <laughs> Mr. President, PIOJ, and this is why we will not oppose the resolution, the order. PIOJ has said, in addition to the 1.7 decline in GDP for the March quarter, and bear in mind, the airports were shut about the 24th of March. So it's not a big COVID impact on the March quarter. What the March quarter reflected is the continued decline in our economy, the continued contraction in our economy since last fiscal year. So 
Let us not make the mistake to say prosperity was there. The government had long given up the five in four. They have long given up the five in four on the positive side. No, they're hugging up minus 5.1 on the negative side. So they're getting the four years, but they're not getting the positive five. They're getting a minus five. Mr. So President, so bad is it? And I believe the Auditor General has relied on the report from PIOJ with one month to go, less than a month to go, that this second quarter, this first quarter, first fiscal year quarter, second calendar year quarter, but the April to June quarter, we'll see a 12 to 14 percent decline in the GDP of our country. This is the ice decline for four decades. We never saw it in the 18 years that they love to curse. We never saw it in the 70s. This is the ice. And for that reason, Minister, because of that big blow on our economy, it would be good for us to come together, to work together, as Senator Webby said. Let us work together to fix this economic thing. We saw it in early March. We pointed it out to you. We saw it in February when Wicker McNeil raised it in a PAC meeting. The opposition saw what was coming, but the government was fiddling while China and the rest of the world was sneezing. So, President, nationally, the BOJ has said we're likely to decline between 4 and 7 percent this year. The government has said to the Minister of Finance that it could be 5.1 percent. The reality, however, Mr. President, is that this COVID thing is not over. It is not over. It is not over. I was frightened watching the press conference from OPM on Friday and Monday. After the Prime Minister spoke, the Minister of Health came up. And the Minister of Health said, with the opening up of the borders, we must brace for a spike and increase in COVID. That's what's true. He went first. Essentially, he's saying, What did he say all along? And I asked myself, did the Minister of Health sit in the same cabinet with the Prime Minister? Because that seems to be going in opposite direction. They're going in opposite direction. So, are we to expect a second wave? Is that possible? And what would be the impact on the suspension for two years? if we have a second wave. First wave has done an $81 billion hit on the revenue. That's a big hit. First wave has caused a 34, 40 billion excess, extra spend, not on security, Senator Samuda, but on health. Yet the minister tell us we may not use, need those facilities because you should see at home. You should be quarantined at home. So why are we spending so much money to fix up isolation wards if we don't intend to use it? Mixed messages. Mixed messages. Mixed messages. So, President, when I look at the report from the Auditor General, we just got it this morning. Lucky didn't get to read it. But when, one thing the government used to boast about was housing start. This is what the report says on page 3 of the PIOJ. It says, the contraction in the building construction component was due to a decline in residential and non-residential construction. 
reflecting a decrease of 91.2%. Did I get that right? You guys have the paper? Let's see if I read right. 91.2% in housing starts by the NHT to 382 units. That looked to me just as how tourism went dead. That NHT housing start has gone dead. I wonder if that's why the Prime Minister promised a start in August town. <laughs> and he need to carry a drone with him to unknown that them went build a house for all the for lady be who have been killed. So Mr. President, sure. what we are seeing in the economy calls for a national approach. A national approach to finding solutions. All the task force set up without the opposition in can't be the way Senator Webby meant for us to work together. Can't be. By not going through the constitutional route to ground the COVID restrictions, that's not working together in the way Senator Webby said. That's not working together. Mr. President, sorry? You'll be amazed how well we're working together. You, you'll be amazed how well we're working together. Mr. President, Mr. President, maybe, maybe somebody should send to Senator Matthew Samula a, a, a statement by a certain senator in 2015. Leave Andrew alone. Leave Peter alone. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, the mining and quarry sector has been down by 37 percent. I'm being down by 37 percent. Workers, 100 plus workers at Naranda Backside are now going through a period of layoff for three months. Partly because of the economic situation, and yes, Senator Samuda, the company tell us partly because of the problem with the mining license. I see the minister elsewhere saying that still hasn't been resolved. But Jamaican workers are without a bread this week, last week, the week before, and so for three months. It is not only the bauxite work and the tourism workers, workers in restaurants and small businesses. I saw Mark Ricketts quoting Senator Samuda, not quoting you, but he's quoting unemployment figure of 500,000. 500,000. Labor force. So, we would like to help to bring those people back into the workforce. We would like to help the little helper who no longer gets to go to work to earn something because she's not getting more than the 10,000 care. And that's done. We would like to help all those workers who are out of a job now. And so we say to the government, let's work together. Let's work together. Mr. President, last time we had a report on poverty in this parliament was the 2017 report. There has been no report since that. But I believe my friend Senator Samuda will agree with me that with this level of unemployment, that poverty for 2019, 2020, will recall a massive uptick. Yeah, 2020, 2021 will recall a massive uptick. In other words, at the end of four years, 
you can't show prosperity because it's poverty. Hard poverty on the land of the people. For whatever cause it, whatever cause it, all the things we left there and you were praising for prosperity, whatever cause it, the end result, the end result, your bottom line will be an increase in poverty. It will be an increase in poverty. And you can't whitewash it. You can't PR it over. Or people are poorer at the end of your term. So, President, we'll get a chance later when we discuss the, the report on crime, to deal with crime. But that gone up. Suffice it to say, last night alone, there were eight, yesterday, were eight murders. Eight. I don't know if any it's connected to the COVID and the hardship on the people because we're kind of wicked to each other. But, Mr. President, I want to close by saying hardship is greater on the land than in February 2016. This government has to own the outcome Mr. President, I hear your side, but you as a lawyer, you as a Queen's Counsel, know that in law... Senator Brown, it, let me finish. Lord, let me finish. Let me just say something. Aside, aside, but I apologize. It was... You don't I, need to apologize. I was thinking about something else. You don't need to apologize. You don't need to apologize, Mr. President. Mr. President... No, no, I understand. Mr. President, in law, there's a theory called a tin, tin skull. Tin skull. Tin skull. Yeah. Tin skull theory. You may be too young to know it. You know. The tin skull theory says you take your victim as you find the victim. So if George Floyd had preconditioned at comorbidities, as you all love to say. The neck, the, the knee in his neck killed him. So if this economy had comorbidities, if it has weaknesses, if you found it and promised prosperity, and now you are delivering only poverty, you take the country as you found it. You could avoid some of it by working in cooperation and collaboration with the opposition. We offered then, we offer today, and we'll keep offering because we love this country. We believe you too are patriots as we are. But we recognize that the route you have chosen to go it alone means that you must not only get the victories of recovery, but you must suffer the victims of the hardship caused by your policies, which has been contributed much by COVID. We still stand as an opposition to help you. Because in the end, we want to take over a country that is not worse than it is now. May it please you, Mr. President. Thank you. President. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, to support uh, the, uh, the bill as presented, the FAA bill, and I will support it strongly. But before I do that, Mr. President, order. Before I do that, Mr. President, 
I'd like to, this is one of those occasions where on at least one item, I can join Senator Brown. The pain of our very good friends, our major trading partner, a country with which we've had extremely close ties, the pain of our friends in the United States, I know is felt by all of us in this chamber, all of us in the other place, and in fact, a great many Jamaicans. And as I look at the protests, Mr. President, and the reason why people are out there protesting, my heart pains because having studied and lived in the United States for a long time, having watched the politics of the United States for a very long time, having seen how many people have suffered under all kinds of administrations. Senator Brown named two gentlemen, not just George Floyd, but another gentleman in New York just about a year ago. Sorry, longer than a year ago in another administration. Um, was also killed. Um, and, and we have the issues of Ferguson. Ferguson is under another administration, the New York. Can I, I did not disturb Senator Brown. I am saying, I'm saying, Mr. President, that over the years, since I have studied, since I have studied in the United States, you seem not to have heard that, which is quite a long time, leader. Okay. So I'm saying to you, over these years, across many administrations, the United States have suffered, and we really want to see a change happen in the United States. A change has to come, which is why the people are protesting. But also, in that change, we have to also feel for what I hear Mr. Floyd's uh, family saying, look, this is our country, let's not mash it up. I'd love, my words, I'd love to see as quickly as possible that the, the violence stops and that the policy changes that are necessary will happen. Senator Brown. Call on a man. I wish you would pay me the courtesy I paid you. I did not disturb you. This is my comment. This, this is Aubin Hill in the Senate speaking as an independent senator in this instance. So this is my feeling, Mr. President. It is painful. I hope that the United States, which I consider to be a great friend of Jamaica, will find solutions and that the pain that they're feeling will help them to cause and change policies as necessary to bring peace back and especially recognition of the unfair treatment that many black people have had to face over centuries and decades. And so when we see that, I hope that as we sh express our feelings to our friends, that the changes that they make will address, and it will take time. It's not going to be addressed next month or even in the next year or two. It will take time. But we hope that the steps will be taken in the right direction to make sure those changes come, up, uh, come to be. Mr. Mr. President, I hear the talk about how this has caught up on the government by surprise. The government was out there doing by-elections that we did know about. And I want to say to this chamber that up to last week, the IMF tracking the world economy noticed that governments 
had to put in up to that time, and it's growing. Germany has put in more money since then. Up to that time, they had governments around the world had put in nine trillion dollars to say, look, we have to fix the economy. Now, let me put that in perspective for you. The total GDP production of Japan in 2018 was 4.971 trillion. It's twice almost of Japan's economy. The total GDP of China in 2018 was 13.6 trillion. Nine trillion against that figure shows you the size of the money that has to go into fix COVID-19 in two months. You didn't spend that kind of money in the four years of 1929 to 1933 depression. Put things in perspective. COVID is not ordinary. When Nigel Clark stand, stood up in the other place and said, this is unusual. This is not unusual because it's big. It's unusual because in two or three weeks, you're looking at a depression in your economy of 5.1%. Understand that. It's not just that it's big. Big over four years, you might be able to manage. Big in three years is humongous. 5.1% drop in three weeks is humongous. That's what you're dealing with. So now don't come and tell me, please, when the minister got up and said, look, I have to put a, a supplementary budget and it's going to take down the economy. As we can see now, 5.1%. Oh, you were sleeping. It was coming. You could have known. Which world do we live in? Which world do we live in? Come on. So when, I, when we come in here, Mr. President, and we're asking for this amendment, the amendment of 48C2 is very clear. We did, this was done, and I remember, and you remember Senator Brown, I'm calling your name, how many times Senator Golden come in this house when the IMF program had to be done overnight. We were told it had to be done. Andrew Holness sat in opposition and said to his side, we're going to support the government because this is bigger than us. It has to be done. Andrew Holness to that. So I'm not willing to stand up here and hear people talk about, oh, we'll bring it overnight. When Mark brought it, we supported it because it was for Jamaica. This is for Jamaica. I was there and I said, yes, this had to be done. When we met with the IMF, I was in the meeting and every single time, leader of the opposition, Andrew Holness, then no prime minister, made it clear to stand the guy from, 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 from no, um, um, Netherlands and then to Uma, we will support. And every time the mask was, it never shift. Andrew was right there. So if it was overnight, him read the bill and him coming and support it. What are we talking about? Uh, COVID, we couldn't see it and you couldn't see it. So don't tell us that. COVID, you didn't see it and we couldn't see it. Okay. So let me deal with what the issue is, Mr. President. We're asking them to change. We We're asking them to change a semicolon and a full stop and put in three words. And that it boiled down to. The three words are, I'm not sure, or an order. There's a semicolon we have to take out. There's a full stop we have to take out. That's the thing. And you know something, Mr. President, I'm going to make this clear. When, why we're doing that is the way the bill is written, the way the bill is written, there are three, four conditions that you would have to, met, to be met, and all of them have to be in the past. I have read this over and over. You want to read it again? Go back to 40, 48C, number two. 
They might list them down there. And the one, the only one, the one that we're seeking to change, the one we're addressing, is section B that says a severe economic contraction. And when you go to 48A, Mr. Mr. President, it tells you what has what the criteria of a severe economic contraction is. And when we look at that, you have to have GDP drop over four consecutive quarters. That hasn't happened. It's a past tense. It hasn't happened. You have to have over four quarters GDP must have a combined fall greater than 3% for the severe economic contraction to be tr triggered. That hasn't happened. Or a one-time quarter reduction in GDP equal to a greater or 2%, but again, it's based on past performance. It has to have happened. The statin has to, 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 to review it and approve it. PIOJ has to see it. And then you ha that's when you get it done. So we'd have to wait another one or two more quarters and then have the report come out before we could change. COVID doesn't allow you that time. As the minister said in the other place, delay, delay, delay means you kill Jamaicans because we can't give them a little money and the benefit we need to give them. We cannot delay. <laughs> See it here? Handwriting in red. Come read it yourself. My red and blue handwriting. The no speech. Me tell you what me know. Me know this. So, Mr. President, the amendment we're seeking. Senator, is, Senator Morris. Yes, sir. And we have senators on both sides. We're moving along so nicely. Just allow the minister, the yeah. member to speak in adjustment. Is the basis, what is the basis of your rising, Senator yeah. Morris? I, I am rising because, Mr. President, I'm confused as to what the member is speaking. Maybe you discuss your confusion with the member after because I want no, him to continue his speech. Because the member keep on referring to the bill, the bill. Well, we yes. Have yeah, but you know that, you know that, it's all right. I'm sure that he has taken that into consideration, but I'm going to ask you to allow him to finish. I did, I did say order earlier, and yes, I have said bill and order, but let's stick with order. What we want is the thing done. I hope we understand that. That's what we're dealing with. So, I'm, I'm saying to you, the order that is before us, to be precise, Senator Morrison, is that we need to make sure that we can do this and there is a law that allows us to do that it's called the disaster risk management act passed passed by that other side's government in 2014 and so mr president uh, while i hear about Oh, the Constitution, and you must live by the Constitution, and who is a hero, and nationalist, and patriot, and who is a partisan, all them sign of something there. It makes no sense at all, because I tell you what, the law allows us to do what we're doing. There is the, the present FAA, 48C, needs to have past uh, data COVID does not allow us to wait and wait for, for past in fact Mr. Mr. President this something just last week I had to I address the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica they had a webinar for a couple hundred people and the accountants have the same problem while they were making, if, if you had to deal with the accountants before, before IFRS came in, you had to deal with IAS if you're on the British system and GAP if you're in the United States. On the IAS and now on the I, IFRS, all the regulations were made looking 
to a mistake of management and or the board. In other words, management give away too much money to the bank or they give the bank's money to them friend and you know, all the stuff, I will not say Ray, 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 because we don't speak like that on this side. <laughs> Be believe me, when you come from St. Elizabeth and Southfield and you speak my part one, you tell me that Jamaican can understand me. You out of it, you can't, that now, that now refer. So don't bother with that. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I said, Mr. President, what the accountants have had to deal with is not malfeasance by management and the board or even something that would be unusually big, but something that was pandemically big. And therefore, it dropped in the lap of banks, and I'll take banks uh, because it's an easy example, and the central banks of the world, not only ours, something that says, hey, your income is going to be wiped off by a huge percentage. Pick anyone you want. You're probably going to have to make provisions larger than you could ever think of when you were studying in school and, and practicing as, as a banker. It's beyond you because it's pandemically driven. And the accountants know, and the central banks are going to have to say, well, how do we treat this? Do we tell them to make an impairment immediately on the balance sheet? Do we stretch it out? If we make impairment, your biggest, strongest banks immediately become very weak, and your weak ones have to close. You begin to lock down the economy. So decisions have to be made very quickly in a short time on COVID, because COVID wasn't seen the same position our noble finance minister had to, was put in when he had to deal with COVID that was not predicted. So here we are, Mr. President. I believe that the amendment we've sought to put in using the DRMA, the, the Disaster Risk Management Act, is necessary because it is so urgent we must not allow the perfect that some people want in a world that doesn't exist to be the enemy of the good, urgent, and very necessary. So I, I am of the clear view that using the DRMA does no violence whatsoever to the Constitution in this instance. And the Parliament has had three, at least three consecutive weeks to discuss it. There is nothing about transparency. There is time to discuss it. And Mr. President, it is because of those reasons, the urgency, the need of people, we, and the issue of urgency, we couldn't bring this bill to Parliament before the Minister did because we had to work with the IMF. We had to put, we had to get the $520 million from the IMF to make sure we can balance what we're doing. It took time. It went to the IMF board in the 13th of April, I think. They announced it on the 15th. It was, it was approved on the 15th. It was announced on the 15th, and then it, it found its way into the formal paper of the IMF on the 18th of April. So don't, there was no time. To, make, to, to get this done. So we had to make sure we had the money in the bag before we made the announcement. So, the, so the, the Minister of Finance, there was a timing that he had to do with. Having said all that, Mr. President, having seen that the, the using the, 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 the DRMA does no violence at all to the Constitution, and the need is so urgent, I strongly support the order, if it pleases you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Benhill. Senator Skeffer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to make a contribution in this debate respect to the order before us today. 
Well, I heard Senator Hill stated that we're not supporting. Well, let's put it clear. This order was not on the agenda. That was sent to us. I sent to me. And we are making no issue about the debate here today. When Senator Brown started the debate, we didn't point that out. But we understand that we are in a crisis as a nation. And in a crisis, you have to deal with issues as it can present. So we are not here to have a fuss. When it comes to the amendment that was made last week and in the other place, we stated categorically that we supported the proposed amendment. But we asked for some dialogue and a greater understanding. It was not accommodated and we participated in the debate and we supported, we didn't call for a divide. Is when you call for a divide, a signal that you're opposing. So you can have arguments for or against, but it's when you come to a vote, it tells you what you do. And we all supported the amendments in both houses, and we are here in the participation of the order today. So we, we don't need to create, we don't need to create a war, Mr. President. When well, it's not necessary. We need to, so we are supporting and we are moving forward. Let, but let's be, let's be factual. We're moving ahead with the supplementary budget. And you came to a halt in the PAAC. And, the, and I was watching that very Wednesday morning when the FS stated that there are some concerns and we can't proceed. And they adjourned the committee and sought clarification. And then the argument came about the amendment to the FAA. No, 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 no. So let us understand that you are moving in one direction and we realize that the procedure and the governance framework were not being followed as it ought to and hence we are doing the, the, the tidying up. So that, that's part of the reality. Hence we have not yet even part supplemental. If it wasn't necessary to do this as a prerequisite, why would the past supplemental choose in the House of Representatives, in the lower house? It has to go back to PAC and then to the lower house for the final pa passage of the supplemental. So why we are here trying to confuse the thing? There are some young students watching to want to understand how government is working. So part of our aim is to also let them understand that there are procedures to be followed. Expedience is important, but not at the expense of the procedures, the rules, and the law. And of course, you can always change rules. That's why we have a parliament. That's why we have amendments. So if you didn't amend the FAA Act last week, then you're going to have this order today. And that's where we are. So it's a procedure to ensure we do what we have to do. And, as, and none of us under, underestimating the impact that COVID has had and is having or uh, may have in the future. No, man, I, I, I'm not sure arguing to you. There are more than one audience. So don't pick, the, don't pick the fight. There's no need to. So we understand where we are. As we suspend the fiscal rules, Mr. President, and as we we we'll all agree that in the time of crisis we are, we must. Let us ensure we don't suspend prudent fiscal management. Yeah, yeah. Suspending the rules doesn't give us a room to go on a spending spree. And I want to make that clear so we can talk about 81 billion holding the budget and to find 34. We know that there are future activities around the corner, Mr. President. And from where you and I sit, we know we monitor those activities also. We can't have these measures. We're suspending the path that we were on for the benefit of the nation in terms of our debt to GDP ratio. And when we should achieve that 60%. And then we have 46 million or less expenditure in the town of Ocherios to clean up Ocherios. It can't be, Mr. President. And we have to, we have, so we have to be clear. If we are going to, no, if we are going to have these measures at this time, we have to get value for money. Value for money. Oh, you just keep talking about Manchester. 
Mr. President, ah. Senator, no, let me address it. Senator Hill seemed to be on a party to defend corruption. Yeah. When Sir Kirkpatrick Scurford doesn't de defend corruption in any way, shape, or form. And let me tell you, no, let me tell you, if my mother was charged and got a fair trial and convicted, she must go do her time. Right? So I don't care, I don't support corruption. You can defend it. I don't know why you are so obsessed with defending corruption. But I don't. So if politicians are involved, if civil servants are involved, if ordinary citizens are involved, if they charge, found guilty, fear child, they must wear short pants and go to prison. I don't defend corruption in any way, shape or form. And I'm speaking from my philosophy and character. So, so when you keep on talking about Manchester, as if you're going to box me in a corner, you open up the corner, you can call all you want. Remember the financial system and there's allegations about you too. So let's keep it quiet. Let's keep it quiet. Let's get back on track. Yeah, man. So, 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 uh, no, and, 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 and Mr. President, each time corruption argument comes in the Senate, it's as if Senator Hill Senate, gets nervous. Point of, I want to raise a point of order, you know, Mr. Mr. Well, because there was a specific comment that was made regarding um, Ocho Rios. Yes. And it is being said by Senator Skeffrey that that represents corruption. But there is nothing that... That is what that is where it started and he said it. President. He said it and referred to Ocherius and said that that, that, that that is corruption. Mr. President. And then he keeps going down the same line. So I'd ask him, Mr. President, because he's casting aspersions when there is nothing. There is nothing which is on the table that indicates that. What? Nothing. Mr. President. Mr. President, I said the allegation of, of expenditure of $46 million in this prudent thing. Then I went to corruption. Senator, so Senator Skeffrey, you notice I never call on you to defend it, right? Thank you, Mr. So President. So just continue, please. Thank you for your excellent ruling. Mr. President, as we move forward, Mr. President, as we move forward, Mr. President, corruption seems to be energizing some. Yes, I wonder why. Then you can. The President has ruled and is an excellent presiding officer. What? You remember that. Just qualify that as the part of the time So, Mr. President. He never said on this point, he never qualified. <laughs> Skeletor Skeffrey, just go on, please. Mr. President, we don't want in this period where we are relaxing our fiscal rules that we have money being spent under the notion of bushing program yes. that you can't account for. Yeah, we're laughing. So we can't talk on one hand about people suffering. And we need to get these measures quickly to protect our citizens. Then on the other hand, we are wasting resources and can't account for it in any way, shape, or form. I'm citing examples. And these are real examples. So let's understand the context we are operating in. Because whatever the measures we are passing today will have impact on the future of our nation and in the next generation to come. Because a high debt burden is a rope around the neck yeah. of the future of the country, Senator Hill. You and I know that very well. And hence, the reasons then to put it into law to aim for those targets. So while we're changing it, and a simple amendment as it seems, last week and the order today, it has fundamental consequences yeah if not properly managed yes. and prudently managed yes. 
in the continued financial interest of our country. Not you and I. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be gone at some point in time here. Right. So let's understand that. One of the, one of the rationale again for this rule is the COVID care grant that we need to get money more out there to the people. Sir so President, we need to ensure that we have proper accountability yes. in terms of the care package program. Yes, the, the program was hurriedly, hurriedly shut down. Just like that. And let me ensure that if it closed, it closed. Yes. We have no back door open yes. where applications can sweep in. Yes. As we move into yes. as we move into a different period. Yes. I, not, I, I, I said we need to ensure. You're not listening, now, Senator. I said we need to ensure. So it's the same as you need to ensure that you drive carefully on the road. Yes. And not impure the motor that you're driving poorly. Yes. We need to ensure. And Mr. President, I know from whence I speak, so I have no need to defend it. That's right. We need to ensure we have no back door opening uh, of the registration uh, for the government uh, care uh, package. Uh, As we move into another phase. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, man, you can say it, no problem. And perhaps I learn from you. But we need to ensure. Because I know people like you operate. I think he has gone too. He has gone a little too far now, Skeffrey. You have gone a little too far. Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm asking that Senator Skeffrey withdraw that comment. No, no, no. What did I say? Senator, 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 Senator Gale. What did I say? Senator. Oh, now we're joining one. Oh, Senator Gale. Senator Gale. Senator Gale. No, one minute. Senator, Senator Fraser Baines. Senator Fraser Baines and Senator Brown. I have allowed members to raise their objection to give you a little time to just think about what you said. And just withdraw it and move on, please. What should I withdraw, Mr. President? Tell me what you said. No, no man, I, I, I'm not the one objecting. And I don't know. That's what so what should I withdraw? As, I don't know. As I, I can't withdraw what I don't know. As I understand. So you, you're going to take me on over it? Do what, Mr. President? You're going to take me on over it. As opposed no, to just No, I'm not withdrawing. taking on. I'm asking what should I withdraw, Mr. You President? Said, you said words to the effect that people like you, him, you said to a fellow senator, I know people like you in the context of corruption. That's what you did. In the context of I stated nothing like that. That's your interpretation, Mr. President. All right. That's so, your interpretation, and I'm not withdrawing it. Okay. I am not. That's Senator, your interpretation. Senator, rule me out of order. I am not. I'm not on a point of order. On a point of order. On a point of order. No. Your task is to keep order in the Senate. When people like Senator Sinclair continue to provoke and harass the Speaker, so you are, you are well, agreeing no, let me finish, that, please. Minute. So you are agreeing, let me finish, you are agreeing let me, let me, that he was provoked into no, making no, no, the statement. No. But, but but what it felt what I'm urging you, Mr. President, is to control the likes of Senator Sinclair. Okay, who I, Senator, wants Brown, to push, Senator Brown. Push an Senator agenda, Brown. You're but not can't make, take Senator the Brown. That you're comes. not making a point of order. You're trying to tell me how to do my job. Not Senator a point Skeffrey, of order. Senator just Skeffrey just pointed out what a fantastic work I'm doing, and I'm going to call on him. In the interest of, of, of the relationship between us, the senators, just withdraw the statement because it's hurtful. Just withdraw it. Mr. President, I am not withdrawing a statement that I did not make. But, but, but if it hurts. Mr. President, with your leave. If it Mr. Hurts, President, with your leave. Senator. Mr. President, with your leave, is it that you have given a ruling and asked for action to be taken by a senator and it is now being refused? No, Senator. No, I, 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 that's my right to, you know. Senator, Senator. That's my right to. One minute. Minister, Minister, I have issued a ruling. 
what I have done is I have appealed to the better sense of the speaker so that we can continue. If you Mr. Want, Mr. President, can I, say, can I, tell you I, I, am not, I am not sure what I've said. Well, but I, I, can, no, let no, let me, no, man, I, I'm on. going where you're going. No, I'm man, going no, where don't, you're going. No, don't go where I'm going just so. Let me send for the Hansard and show you what you said. Yeah, man. And if yeah. you say, if you look at the Hansard, you yeah. said this don't look right, you no. can withdraw it. Yeah. Right? And if you think it's so, all God, I will. Yeah, man, no problem. So yeah, continue man. subject to that. I am fortified by the assessment of Senator Skeffrey yes. earlier on of my capacity. And don't, and don't, don't, as let, don't let me have to withdraw that, Mr. President. Don't let me have to withdraw that. Oh, but you're no caveat. Yes, Senator sir. Skeffrey, can I tell you something? I always enjoy your presentation because you bring a certain earthiness to the contribution, right? So why is, why is so, Senator Sinclair so joining you? What Senator, what Senator Brown is saying is that Senator Sinclair provoke you. But you can't, you can't do that, man. So go on, I will get it. I will get okay. It. So Mr. President, so Senator Sinclair, I, if I did, that was not my intention. My apology, love and respect. <laughs> No, you can't tell me who to apologize. Hold on. You hear Senator Skeffrey. Senator Skeffrey apologized to Sinclair. And Senator Sinclair accepted it. I don't need the hand side. Please continue. You don't tell me. Who. Continue, so, Mr. Senator. President. Senator Skeffrey, continue. Yeah. But none of us in this honorable Senate must seek to defend corruption. None of us. In any way, shape, or form. Directly or indirectly. Right? So don't use one corrupt act to justify another. And I will say, if we're going to spend the people's resources, money, in this environment, we must do so properly, value for money, yeah. transparency, and clear accountability. Uh, you're not, it's not no one's personal resources that you spend and put up equipment to benefit you and so on. Must serve the people. And I will not change that view, no matter what. And that is the principle I stand on. And anybody don't share that principle, no problem. So I don't support corruption. Could a Manchester St. Elizabeth Senator doesn't matter where. It could be Barbara Green in St. Elizabeth, it doesn't matter where. Corruption is wrong in every way, shape, or form. And any one of us in this house don't believe that. It represents a sad day for the country, whether you're a JLP, PNP, or non all. That must be the collective will. So don't try to hide what I'm trying to put on the agenda in the cloud as to what I was say, said I didn't say. So for that, Mr. President, I want to make it absolutely straight. So the COVID grants, I am, I am going back there. Yes, go back there. If it is closed, yes. the government must say so categorically. Yes. If you're going to reopen, no, you're going to reopen. You must reopen to yeah, man. And I'm, I'm, and I'm reinforcing. I'm calling for a reinforcement now of that statement. I'm calling for a reinforcement of that statement. Senator, Minister, Samuel. Words, must be action. And if you're going to reopen it, Let's do so. Because we, why I am suspicious? Yes. We set a closing date. And with little or no warning, we close it. So that's why people lose trust in the system. Little or no warning. So we can defend all we want to defend. It doesn't matter. No, then, you, then, you, then why you have a... Senator, Senator Skeffrey, just talk to me now. Senator Samuda. Yes. So if it is oversubscribed, then you give a progressive report and close the thing at a specific point in time. Right? Because as I heard, you see, Mr. President, we gave the country one impression. I remember in that budget debate when the minister spoke, got the impression that we had unlimited resources. Yes. Could you, if, if every single Jamaican wanted a care grant, I got the impression you could get it. And he was on radio. And we can't get the tape. No, man, I trust, I trust him. 
So, Mr. President, that's just my word of warning. Yeah, man, that's my word of warning. As we move in this period again, I see we hear the 34 million naturally, the greater portion will go towards the Ministry of Health. And that's natural. But one critical challenge out there facing our people, Mr. President, is the issue of water. We can't talk about a pandemic and a health response and sanitization where water remains a fundamental issue. So I don't know what the plans will be under this special need for this urgent resource. But we have to have continued supply of water. If not, the NWC system, which we understand, will be more difficult to upgrade instantly. But no, man, you, you, can, you can close the debate when you're But we need to ensure that we have a provision even by way of consistent trucking of water, yeah. especially in the rural areas. Yeah. This remains a fundamental problem. And as the Minister of Health warned us about a spike in the second round, and I mean, say no, no, son, but I believe you know. Minister of Health. So if you're going to have a spike, according to the government, by no lesser person than the Minister of Health, who you must expect me to believe and trust, then we have to put in under the special rearrangement, sustainable program or emergency program for chucking up water in the, in, in the shortest instant. We understand to expand supplies by NWC it will be challenging because of the time. But we are ensure water remains a fundamental problem. I want to turn to how we will respond to in our education sector. I've, not, I've heard about health. Monday school will reopen for a section of our students' grades 11 and those doing key 12 and grades 12 and 30. And schools are trying to ensure they adhere to the Ministry of Health protocols. But I need a lot of resources. Yeah. And as we think about the restart of a new school year, we have to use the summer period that is approaching to build out the new infrastructure. To create way for the new normal. Yeah. Many of us don't understand even infrastructure is arranged in our schools. Many of the schools have the chairs, they are welded to each other. They hardly can move. Little or no space between each. You have no need for the notion of six feet physical or social distancing. So if you're going to replace some of those, you need new infrastructure. And let's understand that even before COVID, many schools had a problem when it comes to furniture, yeah, chairs and decks. Yeah. That is the current reality yeah. prior to COVID. And if you're going to have greater space, you have to retire quote and quote some of those chairs and decks. Yeah. Then you're going to need more space for the, for, the, for the challenges. As we talk about the response in the education system. We're going to need more guidance and counselors in our system. Yes, yes. Many of these youngsters, Senator Langmore, have been traumatized. Yeah. And I'm sure we can all agree on that. I don't, I, I don't think we get a point to order for this. Many of them. And worse, the mixed signal from the government when it comes to those who are going to do. CXC, CSEC, ANCAPE, and other external exams. You can't boldly announce that you have struck a deal with CXC to start the exam this July 27th. And then with no announcement prior to, CSEC sends out the timetable. Mr. President, Mr. President, it is now intended to proceed with the second matter on the agenda for today. And as indicated earlier, it will be led by Senator Samuda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Samuda.
just going to remark that the absence of some recognition of your standing suggests that you are now seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I will be dealing with the matter at item number three on the government business on the order of business. The report of the Joint Select Committee of Parliament, which was set up to review and report on the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act 2014. Mr. President, presented for the consideration of this Honorable Senate is the report of the Joint Select Committee established to review and report on the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act 2014. This report, Mr. President, was tabled in the House of Representatives on May 19th and adopted by that body on May 27th. By way of a reminder to the Senate, the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act 2014 is also known as the Anti-Gang Act and was passed in 2014 and makes provisions for the disruption and suppression of criminal organizations and related matters. The development and adoption of the Act was in part also a response to the 2013 National Security Policy, which identified the activities carried out by organized criminal groups in Jamaica as a Tier 1 threat. The Act makes it an offense to establish a criminal organization in Section 3, recruit a child or an adult into a criminal organization in Sections 4 and 5, become a member of a criminal organization in Section 6, lead, manage, and direct a criminal organization in Section 7, provide benefit to or gain benefit from a criminal organization in Section 8, aid and abet a criminal organization in Section 10. It is important to note, Mr. President, that all these offenses carry high penalties with the act in the current configuration also identifying some offenses that can be considered aggravating factors when it comes to sentencing. Mr. President, the review by the Joint Select Committee was undertaken pursuant to Section 21 of the Act, which requires a review be conducted by a Joint Select Review Committee of the Houses of Parliament, no later, not later than three years after its adoption. The committee, which was chaired by the Honorable Dr. Horace Chan, Minister of National Security, comprised members of Parliament, including Honorable Delroy Chuck, Marlene Malahu Fort, Alanda Terrellong, Fitz Jackson, Mark Golding, Peter Bunting, as well as Senators Ransford Braham, Charles Sinclair, Kerencia Morrison, Donna Scott Motley, and K.D. Knight. The, com oh dear. the, co the committee starting, started meeting from as early as October 24, 2018, and convened a total of 20 meetings, along with presentations from the Ministry of National Security itself. The committee also benefited from the input of several stakeholders, including the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Major Organized Crime and Anti-Corruption Agency, the, Na the Norman Manley Law School, the Jamaica Constabulary, and the Jamaica Constabulary Force. All of their views were ventilated and recommendations outlined in the report. Mr. President, the review was undertaken within the context of what now exists in our society as it relates to organized criminal activities. Criminal gangs continue to pose a threat to the vision of a prosperous and secure Jamaica. In fact, the Jamaica Constabulary Force is reporting that at the end of 2019, there were 389 criminal gangs operating in Jamaica. This represents an increase of eight gangs when compared to the 381 in 2018. Of this number, some 250 were deemed to be active. The corporate area continues to account for the largest portion of these gangs. In many communities across the island, Mr. President, Gang members enjoy con strong community support, which makes it difficult to isolate them. Even so, over the last three years, there has been a significant increase, increase in the number of gang members identified, apprehended, and prosecuted. Over the period 2017 to 2019, the security forces arrested and charged 595 members for various and serious gang members for various and serious violent crimes. During 2019, specifically, 55% of murders were attributed to gang activities. In order to disrupt, suppress, and ultimately dismantle the operations of criminal gangs, the strong legislative support will need to be present. This is why the work of the committee was so important. Mr. President, the major recommendations which highlighted in the report 
which is being tabled, well, which was tabled and being considered today, include removing serious offence, removing serious offence in section two, and replacing it with the term applicable offence. This amendment will afford the first schedule of the act to be amended to include offences related to simple larceny and receiving stolen property. This change was considered since criminal gangs are known to engage in simple larceny and receiving stolen property as primary criminal enterprises. The term applicable offence in which serious offences will therefore facilitate the inclusion of offences that may not classically be considered serious offences. We must note these offences help to fund the activities of gangs. An amendment to section 6.3 of the act to include any identifying signs and symbols, including gang tattoos and paraphernalia, that the court may take into account when determining whether a person is a part or a participant of a criminal organization. The expansion of, the, of benefit as it is now provided for in section 11 of the act. This would deal with the persons that had not professed to be a participant of a criminal organization but may indicate or otherwise suggest that they were acting on behalf or instruction of a member of a criminal organization. The commission of some offenses have been highlighted as aggravating circumstances to be taken into consideration during sentencing and will attract an additional 10 years of imprisonment. These include if a person uses any premises in furtherance of gang activity, similarly to what obtains in the Lotter Scamming Act. If a person is involved in aiding, abetting, inciting, or inducing an act of violence as a part of the process of recruitment of a child. If a person has in their possession any item of dress, designation, or description of a law enforcement officer. Mr. President, the Joint Select Committee made recommendations consequentially, to consequentially amend the Criminal Justice Administration Act to make it an offense to disclose any information in relation to an investigation being conducted or about to be conducted in respect of an offense under any legislation. Additionally, a recommendation is made to amend the Constabulary Force Act to allow for a search and seizure provision. Mr. President, colleagues, I look forward to the Senate adopting the report of the committee, which will be sent to the Cabinet for approval upon ad adoption. It is the hope of the government for the Anti-Gang Act, new and improved, would be back, for the Anti-Gang Act, new and improved would be back before this August body in no time for approval. I thank you. Thank you, Minister Samuda. Senator Scott Martley. Senator Gailey, always looking out for me, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. President, I had the honor to sit on this Joint Select Committee, and it was a very interesting experience. Did Rani come to the meeting? <laughs> Let me just say that the participation was fulsome. <laughs> and in a way, very enlightening. I have to say that various persons uh, appeared before the committee and made submissions. But one of the things that I think all members of the committee was a bit surprised at was that it did not appear as though the police knew some of the powers that they had. The different groups who were asking for the changes and amendments had not sufficiently looked at legislation which already provided them with that power. I think, and I would say that it, it was not a partisan reaction on the part of the Joint Select Committee, but we were really surprised by that. And I believe that some way has to be found to solve that problem. The, the, the minister who presiding as chairman was himself quite surprised and I think that he would know, recognize the need to put some things in place to familiarize all the different entities 
with what authority has already been provided by the legislation. Because respectfully, you can amend legislation from here till eternity. That doesn't, is not necessarily the source of the problem. The source of the problem can be appreciating how you use the powers which it grants. And also, also recognizing the scope of the legislation, but also the implementation, the investigative steps which must be taken to bring it into reality. And I think all of us recognize that. Mr. President, one of the things that, you know, when we were discussing the applicable, changing from serious to applicable, there was a, a, a point which was raised about the inclusion of simple larceny because of the term simple larceny that made it seem like a minor sort of offense. And one had to be at pains to point out that, in fact, in law, you can get up to five years for a simple larceny offense. So sometimes I think might be we need to word some things a little differently so that we can. <laughs> yes, but you see, that's what, that's what they said at your basically teeth. Thank you, Senator Sinclair. But, but, but the fact is that the penalties can be quite onerous. As we looked at it, we recognized that we were learning a lot about how the gangs function. Because offenses which you would not have previously considered when this uh, act was passed in 2014, you now had the benefit of the investigation to show, for example, that the stolen, st um, receiving stolen goods would have to be considered because the gangs actually are financing themselves by stealing uh, things and then selling it. That was a way of which they would strengthen their organization. I had a little bit of discomfort about the tattoos. Yes. And as a mother of a young man, and interacting very closely with all of his friends, because that is my duty, that is how I know what is happening. You see, they say you, you make the children come to your house, so you get to know them, and then you have a sort of overview of what is and what is not. But so, so, so young people nowadays don't look at tattoos with the same kind of abhorrence as, the, as older people. And it's... <laughs> you have one, Mr. President, is that an admission? <laughs> so, 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 Mr. <laughs> if you'll just give me a moment. <laughs> so, Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. President. So, so... When we look, when we judge people because they are tattooed, they don't have a problem with it at all. And I hesitated in a, agreeing to that being one of the, the features. You see, I didn't understand, though, that there are gangs who actually have symbols. And... I was telling my colleagues about seeing a young man with a teardrop on his face and going up to him and saying, you shouldn't put that on your face. It means you'll be crying tears for all of your life. Okay, so I didn't know it was a symbol for a gang. I just did not know. And they have, <laughs> some of them have a, uh, who know what is happening on the ground tell me that when I see more than one, it also has significance because it represents the amount of persons who you have killed. It was enlightening. I cannot pretend that I still don't have serious reservations because of the, the fact that it might be accidental, the fact that a gang might have a rose and I might have a rose, you know? I, I, Mr. President, that is one of the most profound statements that I've heard you make in a long time. <laughs> but it means that you, uh, you, get, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> it could happen. And I do know somebody, quite coincidentally, I do know somebody who is married to Rose. I do not know if he has a tattoo, which is a rose. But I'm open to listening. <laughs> so, so, Mr. President, there were... There, there, 
One, one of the things that we had to spend some time thinking about seriously were those persons who would go to school and recruit young boys to be, in particular, to be members of gangs. And you know, Mr. President, one of the things that we have to understand in our society is that a lot of young boys are fatherless. They are grown by grand grandmothers, usually, who do not even understand what it is that a ma male experiences. And I'm sure Senator Longmore will bear me out on this, that what everybody wants to belong. People seek to belong. People join organizations because they want to belong. People want to feel like there's, they matter. And some of what drives these persons to be members of gang is because they actually have a group of persons with whom they can connect. So I think if we are going to solve some of the problems that we encounter, we have to start at the bottom of the problem. And we have to identify what drives these people to participate in these activities. Why, look, why they call themselves fatherless crew? Why, you know, why they name themselves the way that they do? And, 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 and why it is that they have to resort to that sort of identification? It is basically because they are failed. They are failed by parents, they are failed by caregivers, and ultimately, they are failed by the society. So, so Mr. President, I will make one further observation. Because since I was a member of this committee, I do believe that I should give others who did not have the benefit of sitting there and listening and making the recommendations the, the opportunity to do so. The intelligence around the gangs has to be strengthened. If we can actually identify how many we have, and where they operate, and the tier, the level of threat, the numbers were actually associated and involved in gang activity. You know, Senator Sinclair, you're beginning to worry me, you know, because we are agreeing a lot these days. <laughs> no, but if we can do all of that, then there is a missing link. We need to do something more. And I can tell you that the public asks, this don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Actual numbers, 589 people, down to that specificity, and we can't apprehend them. And then, and then, Mr. President, when we put them before the court, we have, and this is, this is no, Dexter Gang put before the court, and then the trial can't proceed. Or we have U-shaped Gang before the court, and because, and no case submission succeed. I don't think we have got the decision yet. The, 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 we have been promised a decision in January. Oh no, I think that it was concluded and we were promised the, the decision in 20 January. Promised decision in January. Not sure the verdict is out yet. Um, they, they, I read it where the Chief Justice was explaining that they were getting some equipment that collates the evidence and it's puts it in a particular format. Yes, he had promised the judgment in 2019, but it's not ready. No, the trial is still continuing, you know. No, the trial is not completed. The trial, that's, that's the point I was making, that the trial is concluded. Um, but we... We are awaiting the decision which had been promised in 2019, January 2020. But, you know, things, I think that we should extend some sort of consideration in light of just That's how everything ago, has been um, proceeding. So, so we need to sharpen that aspect of it. Because when a man is not afraid of the threat of a sentence, you know, it's like when we used to hang people for murder. Nobody's afraid of the threat of being hanged. But when you start convicting persons, 
a man knows that the possibility is I'm going to be caught and I'm going to be found guilty. And that is the tone we have to set if we are trying to change the thing. Let the people know that they have to think twice because the possibility of being apprehended is grave and serious. So, Mr. President, I know this, there will have to be amendments as a result of this report, and we await them, if it pleases you. Thank you, Minister. Is speaking after the leader, Senator Brown. Yeah. I'm a gang of one. And this side. Mr. President, may, may I just say that I'm a support of trial by jury. I hold that view when I was over there. I hold that view over here. And this is not a criticism, it's just an acknowledgement that with a case ending in September last year, and to wait nine months for the verdict, just look unreasonable to me. Had there been a jury, I assume in a matter of days, the most complex of cases. So it's a concern I have with the anti-gang situation is to wait nine months for a verdict when the court is trying to move to a more complex case, civil or otherwise, in six months. Just doesn't sound fair to the people who have been charged. Mr. President, as we look at this anti-gang trial, anti-gang report with the fancy name of Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organization Act of 2014. I really want to ask how many gangs have we suppressed? It seems to me there have been an increase in the number of gangs. So the suppression of criminal organizations doesn't seem to be succeeding partly because of what the leader of opposition business just said. The government is not and the state forces not recognizing the power and the authority they have. It's easier, say, Mr. President, to put Susan Bogle away. She was not a gang member. And nobody has said she was a gang member. It's easier, it's easier to put Javon, Javon Duane from Bray Street away while he's eating bun and cheese and sausage. Nobody has said he was a gang member. It's easier to break the foot of a young man in Majesty Garden. And nobody has said he was a gang member. And today, Mr. President, we got the report of Noel Chambers. Nobody said he was a gang member. In other words, as they memorialize George Floyd in the United States today, the funeral is going on, one of the funerals going on now, we have not been kind to our people who are not gang members. I cite these cases. And I want, on behalf of the opposition, to urge this parliament, the parliamentary committee that exists to review reports from our, the commissions like Indicom, to meet and review this report from Indicom. It's damning on all of us. Not this government, previous government, but all of us in this chamber. All of us in this chamber 
must take some responsibility. And I call as part of that responsibility for the committee of parliament set up to review this report to do so and do so with some amount of urgency so that the wrongs being done by us against our people can be corrected. So when we stand with the other people abroad, we do so with the clearest of conscience and knowledge that we are not hurting our own people. just want to say that. Mr. So President, having called on the Parliament to act, I note that the Parliament have acted on some issues. We have passed laws. I well recall when the police before 07 was calling for a suite of legislation, including the anti-gang legislation. They got it. They got it. But how well have they used it? Imagine in the committee, Mr. President, the Ministry of National Security is saying we must change in the act. The fancy name act, the suppression of criminal organizations, criminal justice, suppression of criminal organizations. We must change the name of the parish courts from RM to parish judge. But the, the, another law has already, did, already done, done that. But it seems the ministry... The Ministry of National Security didn't understand that. We are about the need for interception of communication, but a law already exists on that. So the impression I have is that it's a desire for new legislation rather than a desire to enforce. And I hope, Minister Samuda, that the amendments proposed by the committee will come quickly. It took about 18 months for the committee work to be completed. I hope it doesn't take that long for us to move these amendments to legislation. Even though the answer to crime fighting is not really more legislation, it's about operating in a way that recognize that our fundamental problems are gangs and guns. Mr. President, on social media, there are pictures of gunmen in the country gathered with high-power weapons, having a party. No, not Portmore. I know you heard it put more. I, I, was, I was going to say Western Jamaica, you know. I was going to say that. And I still not going to say it. You can deflect if you wish. You can deflect if you wish. But, Mr. President, it's clear the problem is gangs and guns. On page five of the report, it speaks to the gang problem in Jamaica. And Senator Samuda raised some of the issues. But if we know the gangs, why can't we find them, infiltrate them, eliminate. and eliminate them? Have we ever searched them? We know the gangs. Otherwise, these numbers mean nothing. Exactly. You ask, the security force asks for the anti gang legislation. We gave it to them. They participated in developing the legislation. We bring it to the parliament and we passed it. But what we here? Three convictions, two convictions, this is Senator Samuda. Of the 595 on page 6 of the report, of the 595 gang members arrested and charged for various breaches under the act, only two convictions were recorded for anti gang matters over the period 2014 to 2018. Has there been any more? 
Only two convictions were recorded. And those two and those two pleaded guilty pleaded guilty. Those two pleaded guilty. So so the issue for us is why are we not getting the gangs and getting the guns? Mr. President, at the end of May this year, the murders in the country was 550, 550. This is with all the COVID curfews, sometimes starting at 8, sometime at 6 p.m., sometime at 9 and sometime at 3 p.m. But some of the criminals strike just before the start of the curfew. I don't know if they fear that there's a lull, but the records show that they have been striking just in the hour before the curfew. So all of these curfews, you think that at 5.50, at the end of May murders. That we made some great progress over last year. Last year, comparatively. Last year, at the same time, January to the end of May, was 553. So with all the curfews, all the SOEs, all the Zozos were down 0.5%. That's not good. That's not success. And something is wrong. It tells me that the SOEs are ineffective. It tells me the Zozos are ineffective. It tells me that the promise of more Zozos is just that. Promise. Because they are going to do something with more Zozos. Last year at their conference they announced 20 more Zozos. None come in. That's what, November to now, that's what? Seven, eight months? Eight months, nothing. And that wasn't the first time they announced more Zozos. So we have promises of more Zozos. We have promises of a crime plan. All of this compounded by the fundamental promise to sleep with our doors and windows open and still be awake in the morning. Murders are out of control. And all we get is promises. Yesterday, Mr. President, the Prime Minister went to Augustown at the scene of the murder of Susan Bogle. Prime Minister took a large media, media entourage. The Prime Minister deploys drones not to fight crime, which is what the drones should be used for, but for PR opportunity. And let me say this. Good sense has prevailed. The PR ad has been taken down from social media. You see, when we go to pay respect to the dead, there must be sincerity. There must be real empathy. It must not be used as an opportunity for self-promotion. And let me commend the Prime Minister for recognizing that what was done yesterday was bad, insensitive, and indecent. I appreciate the fact that he has taken down the ad. There are those who say he should not comment on them shooting. I said to them, but Senator Brown, you know, you refer to the shooting as murder. There is no evidence that it is murder, you know. Mr. President, so you should be maybe there's no murder that Floyd, George Floyd was murdered, Eric Garner was murdered. Oh, 
No, no, I don't. Don't take me down that road. Mr. 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 President, no, what, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. You refer to the killing of the lady as murder. Your Mr. There's a homicide committed. You're comfortable with that? Mr. Mr. President, that because it is a homicide. In law, listen, I see a lawyer sit down in front of you now. In law, without the evidence, murder is something in, is peculiar and particular. And there is no evidence yet that it was the killing was murder. I didn't say anything to you, but I just pointed out to you. Mr. President, I appreciate what you say. The homicide, the, the homicide, the homicide involving Susan Bogle, for whom we seek justice, took place. But what I'm saying to you, you know, homicide suggests that there is a particular course of action. Um, a men's rear and an actor's rear. If you just said the killing of her, it would work. The better. homicide. Okay, anything. Go the on. homicide. The homicide. The one who can't say killing. The homicide. It occurred while she was in her bed. I know sufficient that it's a homicide. I know sufficient point of it's order. a point of order. On a point, point of order. I'm very challenged in understanding the purpose of the Senator going down this line when there are state institutions empowered to independently investigate these matters who have yet to pronounce on what actually happened. And I don't think it's appropriate as senators for us to sit here and make these pronouncements and commentary on matters that are under investigation by state agencies who are empowered by this parliament to be independent. Thank you very much. That is a point of order which I accept. Move on, Senator Brown. Thank you, because that homicide has already been committed. So, President, PR cannot cover the atrocities that are taken abroad are here on our people. This government gave us a commitment to fight crime and to reduce crime and to give us a safe Jamaica. The numbers are not showing that result. Numbers not showing that result. What we need is to end this ineffective SOE. End it. Get back to robust patrolling of the streets. Get to targeting the criminals. Set up a system where trial can take place quickly and conviction, if there is to be conviction, takes place. Mr. President, I'm a firm believer that in getting the guns and the gangs that and held scanners yeah and held scanners that taxpayers money has paid for and have not yet been delivered did you use the word corruption today I'm not going to use it now Mr. President on a point of order and if you continue to do it, I'm going to stand up every time. On a point of order, Mr. No, President. you are irrelevant, you know, so you can stand up. Senator. Mr. President, this House, this Senate, has already benefited from a clear explanation as to the circumstances surrounding the scanners. It was made clear that the pilot program demonstrated that the scanners were emitting higher levels of radiation than we were willing to risk our police officers. But the nexus continues to be made between the project and corruption, which I consider to be inappropriate, disingenuous, and may be considered dishonest. And I ask you to ask the Senator to resign from that approach. Thank you, Senator Morgan. Senator Brown, continue. could help us cut the crime and help us get the guns and put the gangs away. 
this government spent money. Tell me about radiation. Where was the procurement approach? So let me make it plain from the floor of the Senate. I am calling on the Integrity Commission to investigate the contracts in the Ministry of National Security relating to the handheld scanners. Taxpayers' money must not be wasted. In this COVID period, we can see where every cent is needed for the health and education and the safety of our people. And for people to carelessly expend thousands of taxpayers' dollars as if it is their own without going through the proper procurement arrangement and without guaranteeing and telling us that we have received the money back. Mr. President, this is like buying a Porsche and getting the government to put in a charging station. May it please you. Corruption, corruption, corruption. Mr. President, thank you, Senator Brown. Senator, you know, Minister Samuda. Mr. President, thanks to members on well, on both sides, I suppose, that contributed to the debate. And before I put it to consideration, put the motion to consideration um, for adoption, I just wish to make some points. Um, I, I took the point made by Senator Scott Motley, and certainly I wasn't on the Joint Select Committee, but as one that I think is certainly worthy of significant consideration. Um, though it is a point which we have acknowledged even in this parliament before, it clearly requires that we upsize the, the capacity of the legal office, well, by way of numbers of the legal officers that have been provided to the police force. Because obviously, in the preparation of cases and understanding the very laws that, the powers of the laws that they have, it can only benefit the constabulary force if they have greater understanding. Um, on that note, I wish to remind the Senate that in 2017, the JCF benefited from 20 lawyers being hired to give them support in the preparation of cases as well. Now, clearly that's not enough to spread across every police station and every police division, but clearly within areas of greater concern, we will need to... Sorry, you have any idea what the complement of attorneys in the force is, no? I don't have an, I don't have that information, per se, but I know... As a, matter of, as a matter of interest, I would just say. I know 20 were brought on um, in 2017, which... I know all 20 positions are, are filled now. I don't know if it's the same cohort or any persons would have left in, in that time, but I know the positions are filled. Um, but just to make some points in line with, with comments made. You know that there is a view that a, 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 an attorney should be based 24-7 at each and every one of the major squads. And it's a view that I support, Good, Mr. Thank President. You, thank you. And I will look at the, the deployment of these um, um, lawyers, but certainly I think the comment made by Senator Scott Motley and even with a conversation with Senator Morrison behind me, it's something that we have to look at significantly increasing because maybe, maybe, maybe one is insufficient in some, in some areas and maybe we would have greater... Agreed. There were 20s also a significant increase versus what would have prevailed. Get me wrong enough, because you're coming from none to 20, or one or two to 20. It's not an insignificant No, it's, it's certainly I'm nothing to scuff at. What shot, because I want to. I just want to figure so out I what they... No, I just want to figure out what they... What they because I'm the president, as supported by Senator... As supported by Senator Skeffrey. I'm just trying to understand what what quantities you have managed to retain. That's all I'm trying to understand. I will get that information, Mr. President. I would like to make some other points, as matters would have been raised, certainly from Senator Brown's presentation, as he said, the Gang of One. Um, 
he started by saying sort of watching that he was the gang of one. So he did. I'm just saying. It speaks volumes of your power, sir. But safety, the Oxford Dictionary refers to safety as a condition of being protected from. Sorry, Mr. President? The Oxford Dictionary refers to safety as the condition of being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk, or injury. So when we look, and we've often spoken about whether people are safer or not, and it's a, it's a wide debate, and generally how we in Jamaica review our performance with crime, generally we refer to one statistic which happens to be the number of murders in the country, which is certainly the most important statistic because it, it re, um, is related to the loss of life of Jamaicans. But I think it's important, Mr. President, that as we analyze where we are and where we are not, that we understand that as at the end of May, Mr. President, crimes overall in Jamaica were down 17%. So Jamaica reports crimes in seven categories, 17%. And we report crimes in seven categories, right? Larceny was down 39.3% year to date. Rape, incidents of rape reported were down 29.4%. And incidents of rape have been coming down, quite frankly, since the last quarter of 2014. So this is a trajectory, and, and acknowledgement should be given to the JCF in the work in this, in this area. And the clear operate has also increased significantly. Break-ins have come down 18.2% year to date, Mr. President. Robbery is down 12.3%, Mr. President, as at the end of May. Shooting is down 9.9% as at the end of May, Mr. President. And, of course, the numbers that were mentioned related to murder don't give us much to celebrate, but we're down 0.5%, Mr. President. So six of your seven categories of crime as at the end of May are down. And we've seen this as a general trend as we have been looking at the numbers over the past couple of years as the Senate's time has been focused, because of state of emergency debates and other national security debates, has been focused on these numbers. So the trajectory in six out of seven categories of crime under the last four years is pretty clear. And these are statistics from the JCF, Mr. President. Now, additionally, and we await the next state of emergency, the debate as to whether we will or will not extend the varying states of emergency, which have been used to suppress and to assist, well, to bring down crime. But the facts are, using the murder statistic, Mr. President, in six, well, let's look at it. St. James is down 20%. Mr. President, in terms of the murder numbers. This on the back of now having the lowest crime numbers in 25 years, Mr. President. For the last 10 days, every single day, a high-powered rifle has been recovered from St. James. So it shows the success of the security forces and showed why we needed to stay the course in St. James, Mr. President. We are breaking the back of crime in Western Jamaica. We are seeing the successes. In Westmoreland, murders are down 29.5%, Mr. President. Hanover, murders are down 37.5%, Mr. President. In southern St. Andrew, you still have challenges. Murders are actually up by, no, apologies. Murders are down 2.9%. In St. Catherine North, that is the only state of emergency measure which is not yet seeing the success that we in, expect to have over time, murders are up with 12 more incidents than last year, which is a 36% increase. In Southern, in S Southern, in St. Catherine South, murders are down 8%. In Clarendon, Mr. President, murders are down 11%. So, in all but one, are not, but those are not under state of emergency. I am responding to your comment on the states of emergency. I am responding to your comment in, no, but we have no problem, we don't resile from our our responsibilities. We know where there are issues, Mr. President. We know where there are issues, Mr. President, and we do what is necessary to attack those issues, Mr. President. And I didn't disturb your presentation. I listened to every line of it, Senator Brown. Fear or not fear? Not an issue. There are issues, long-standing, decades-old issues in Kingston Eastern, Kingston Central, and Kingston Western. That is well known, well documented, Mr. President. And the fact is the resources that are required are still limited. But to say that a strategy is not working when the numbers clearly state declines in all but one 
and significant declines on the back of declines last year, Mr. President, shows a clear trajectory of breaking the back of criminal gangs and criminal enterprise in these areas. And it's not just based on the murder numbers, Mr. President. All the other numbers in these areas are down significantly. And the numbers that are up, the clear up rate is up on crimes that would have been committed in these areas, and the seizure of guns and illegal narcotics are up in all of these areas, Mr. President. So it is nothing to scoff at, and we must stop twisting numbers and twisting performance. When something is not working or when there's an issue, there is an issue in Kingston Western. There is an issue in Kingston Central. But when something is working and it is on the back of the hard-working men of the JCF and the JDF and MOCA, we need to congratulate and we need to acknowledge performance, Mr. President. Now, I have noted and I myself have concerns about the number of convictions under the anti-gang legislation. But I wish also to make note that A, there is also a trial to start soon, which is related to the Klansman gang, which has, I believe, more than 50 persons on trial, which is the largest such gang um, trial, certainly in the Caribbean, and I won't say anywhere in the globe, but none that I've found thus far in, in any recent history, Mr. President. And it is something that shows sig the benefit of significant detective and intelligence work and it's something that we hope to help to break the crime situation in St. Catherine that has long bedeviled this country, Mr. President. When we look beyond that, you mentioned whether guns or drugs were, were being found. Mr. President, certainly within our SOEs, we're seeing record seizures. Nationally last year, in all categories of illegal narcotics, there were, in, there were um, increased seizures. And in many police divisions across the country, there were record-breaking seizures of firearms and ammunition. And that is a statistical fact. Right? So we can't twist the words and say this would work or that wouldn't work. The fact is what we're doing is bearing some fruit. Now, as I said, until we get at minimum to the regional average, no matter how far we drop, whether we drop by 10, 20 this month, the statistics have been up and down. Every loss of Jamaican life to murder, to, violent, to, to acts of violence is indeed a tragedy. And even if you are down 10 or 20%, wouldn't be, there would be no reason for song and dance. We have a long way to go to undo what has been allowed to set in in this country since independence, Mr. President. There is a long way to go, but I know that we are on that path, Mr. President. I know that Plan Secure Jamaica is taking root in the areas. I know that the investments that have been made in the national security architecture, especially in the areas of intelligence, in the areas of legal support, in the air areas of mobility for police, in the areas of fixing of police stations to give them a decent place from where to, to work, are things that put this country on the right path, that move us closer to safety, Mr. President. With that, I ask members on both sides. Well, you see, gangs seem to pop up all the time, Mr. President. So even though we are treating with the underlying factors, just this week, we would have heard of that Jack gang that would have popped up. However, Mr. President, with... Oh, that, is, that is higher heights than I can manage. Mr. President, that gang is defunct a long time. We're talking about a gang of 15. Anyway, gangs we're talking about. Anyway, Mr. President, with that, with that said, I ask, I ask that the report be approved. Thank you, Mr. President. The question being put by the Minister is for the approval of the report of the Joint Select Committee to review and report on the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act 2014. All in favor? Aye. Against? Ayes have it. Minister? Mr. President, it's not intended to do any further business today. Might the Senate be adjourned till tomorrow uh, for us to continue uh, to address the matters which have been placed on the agenda. I thank you. The Data Protection Act, Mr. President. Okay. Thank you very much. The question is that the Senate be adjourned for till tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. sharp. Um, if you could make an early start, I would appreciate it because I suspect that we'll have a, a pretty rigorous day. Is that so, Minister? All in favor? Against? Senate now stands adjourned. Thank you very much, all.